I'm the uh, director of the David Asper Center for Constitutional Rights, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you here for the launch of our report, um, really your report, the student's report. Um, at first, I want to acknowledge the land in which the University of Toronto Faculty Law operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit River. Today, this place is still a home to many Indigenous peoples from across the whole island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I also wish to acknowledge that the writers and experts made efforts to highlight particular impacts faced by Indigenous people in this report, noting the cultural issues and in particular the geographical challenges that heighten equitable access to abortion across Canada. First, I want to hand um, the event over to Ian Thomas and Lauren DiFelici, who were the leaders of the Asper Center's Reproductive Rights Student Working Group. So, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for being here today. It means so much to us. Um, so, as Cheryl said, my name is Lauren, and I'm joined by Ian. So we are two of the four co-leads for the Reproductive Rights Working Group with the Asper Center. And today we're just gonna give you a really brief overview of what the project is all about before passing it on to our wonderful speakers. So the Reproductive Rights Working Group originated as a response to the Dobbs decision in the United States. So in Dobbs, the United States Supreme Court overturned the holding of Roe v. Wade which had previously maintained abortion access as a constitutional right. So the Dobbs decision then allowed individual states to regulate abortion access, and several states had trigger bans that immediately came into effect post-Dobbs and implemented varying degrees of restrictions. So the working group sought to investigate and respond to the growing concern of how Dobbs may implicate reproductive rights in Canada and whether the Canadian regime may be similarly vulnerable. So the working group organized an expert panel of leading minds in the field last year, and the purpose was really to investigate these pressing issues and to develop some policy recommendations. So the report that we are happy to announce is officially complete. Um, it involves the research of our wonderful student volunteers and incorporates also the recommendations and the comments of our experts on the following four areas. So the first is access to and use of abortion services. The second is international and comparative constitutional norms regarding access and use. The third are cross-border issues between Canada and the U.S., and the fourth was whether or not pursuing legislation or a constitutional amendment would be well advised. And so what we have today uh, that's now in the public domain is a report entitled Improving Access to Abortion Services in Canada, a What We Heard Report. Um, I won't go into the full uh, recommendations. There's 13 recommendations in total, um, but a few of these include expanding information about self-managed abortions through medications, and investing in support for such medications, uh, expanding resources available to Canadian healthcare providers, uh, advising them of any legal risks, including um, if they may face international civil, a civil lawsuit when going down to the United States, even if that's just harassment, intimidation, or restriction of movement. Um, and one of the key recommendations uh, from this report um, that we ought to highlight is uh, it calls and advocates for a federal policy on reproductive rights, uh, complying with the World uh, Health Organization's abortion guidelines. This policy would ultimately set forth commitments and funding uh, to enhance meaningful reproductive lives to people in Canada. So um, I have the pleasure of kind of giving a few thank yous just because uh, this has been a, a project in the making. So I think first and foremost, uh, a big thank you to the Asper Center for supporting this project when uh, we, we came to uh, Cheryl and Tal in uh, the summer of 2022. Um, a big thank you to all the working group members. Many of you are here today and it's great to see you guys uh, for all the hard work. Uh, to our two other co-leads, Vivian Stern and Laura Clark in the back there, uh, thank you for all the help. Uh, to the expert panelists and to Dean Williams for their valuable insights and perspective, not really the substance of the report itself, 
Um, and finally, a big thank you to uh, Professor Emeritus Rebecca Cook, who has been the supervisor who's provided the mentorship, the tutelage, all throughout the length of this project. Um, we're very optimistic that this report will lead to meaningful change and improve access to abortion services in Canada. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, and we look forward to uh, what the panel has to say about the report. So I'm just going to... Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of all of our panelists, a little um, brief summary of their um, bios, and then we'll kick it off with um, Professor Cook. But I want, I'll start by, um, you know, we've already had a, a wonderful thank you, and I echo that thank you to Professor Cook. She's a co-director of the International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program here at the University of Toronto. She's also a legal and ethical issues co-editor of the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics and serves on the editorial advisory board of Human Rights Quarterly. She's a member of the Order of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and a recipient of the Certificate of Recognition for Outstanding Contribution to Women's Health by the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. And she has a whole list of publications, and they're and they're they're um, uh, referenced in the uh, uh, the back of the the report with all of the other experts. Next, we'll be speaking um, Kat Owens, who leads Leaves Reproductive Justice Project. Her work focuses on using law reform to advance reproductive justice in Canada, particularly through Leaves branches. The project focuses on advancing reproductive justice in Canada through provincial and ter territorial law reform advocacy. LEAP works to identify areas in need of law reform, put together reform proposals, target at these areas, and advocate for changes to achieve reproductive, reproductive justice. And the Asper Center has had a long history of working um, with LEAP on various projects. Next, um, we'll be speaking um, Dean Charmaine Williams. Um, is uh, She's the Dean of the uh, Factor in Wintosh Faculty of Social Work. Um, and uh, she uh, served as a reviewer of our report and gave us some very insightful comments and suggestions. Um, her research focuses on health equity issues affecting various populations, including racial minority women, LGBTQ communities, and families affected by mental illness. As a social worker in the mental health care system, Dr. Williams worked with individuals, families, and groups, and was also active in organizational change initiatives directed at increasing access for racial and ethnic minority populations. She has extensive experience developing and delivering professional education in the areas of anti-racism, cultural competence, mental health, and addiction. And I'll leave it there. There's still more to say about her, but you can read that in the report. And then finally, I want to thank um, uh, Professor Cook. Um, oh, sorry, Professor Kostman. <laughs> the, the, the pink is throwing me off, that's it. Um, for coming in and commenting, reviewing the report, and then coming here to comment. Brenda Costman is Professor of Law at the University of Toronto. She joined the Faculty of Law in 1999 and became a full professor in 2000. She was Director of U of T's Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies from 2009-2018. She holds degrees in law from Harvard and the University of Toronto and an undergraduate degree from Queen's. She's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and in 2009 was awarded the Mundell Medal for Contributions to Letters and Law. Again, we'll leave it at that. Um, there's much more to commend um, Professor Kaufman, and I'll turn it first to our online participant, uh, Professor Cook, to turn off her camera and to join okay. us. <laughs> Greetings, one and all. In a world where reproductive justice is really under threat, the student authors of this report and those that facilitated them are to be heartily congratulated for their leadership in challenging Canadians to prove access to abortion and abortion-related services. I wanna highlight in my very brief remarks three significant features of this Asper Center report. First, its pragmatic focus on how to improve access to services and information on those services, as opposed to a narrower focus on the legality of services. This broader focus facilitates dialogue among those working on improving access, including those who are actually delivering services, 
those in schools of social work, schools of public health, and medical schools. So in addition to the pragmatic focus, the second focus of this report is its use of the 2022 WHO guideline. The 2022 WHO guideline, which one of the experts on this panel was very much involved with, Professor Joanna Erdman from Dalhousie, um, sets a new high watermark for international standards relating to abortion that puts women at the center. In essence, the Asper Center report explains what provincial ministries of health need to do to ensure compliance with this report. For example, the importance of framing abortion as essential health care and supporting a plurality of service delivery approaches, including self-managed abortion, as recommended by the WHO guideline. Provincial compliance with the WHO report is especially important because as the report explains, the Morgenthaler decision effectively transferred abortion from federal jurisdiction to provincial jurisdiction. This is not to say that the federal government does no longer have any uh, say in this uh, abortion, delivery of abortion services, but the focus of this report is on improving access, which is really a provincial issue. Finally, the Asper Center reports expansion of the meaning of equality in the healthcare context, whether it is gender equality, intersectional equality, or inclusive equality. The report highlights how different laws and policies disproportionately impact subgroups of women, including indigenous women, adolescent women, or for example, migrant women, that must be done to correct these disproportionately dispropor discriminatory impacts. For example, provincial laws that deny funding for abortions performed outside of hospitals or provincial policies that limit prescribing privileges to doctors and have yet to expand them to nurse practitioners, midwives, and pharmacies. There are many, many other features of this report but it's already, this report is already serving as a model for those in other countries uh, arguing for improved access. But in the interest of time, let me end where I began with repeated congratulations to the, the co-leads and to the working group members of this project. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, there we go. Uh, Cheryl, and thank you, Professor Cook, for those remarks as well. Uh, I just want to echo the congratulations that have been said already to everyone involved with the publication of this report. Uh, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. Uh, I said it back when the panel happened, and I'll say it again now. Uh, it's truly humbling and inspiring to be among such leaders and experts uh, in, in these fields. So I appreciate being here today. Uh, I want to talk about two things that I think are particularly noteworthy in the report. Uh, the first is how timely the report is, uh, and the second is the importance of the themes that it raises. And so I say timely because what we see right now is that we're in the midst of a coordinated global backlash against sexual and reproductive rights, against gender equity, against democracy, against trans rights. And we see this not only in the United States, obviously with Dobbs, which sparked this project, with related abortion bans, with the recent decision in Alabama linked to IVF, but we also see it in Canada in terms of policies that are put forward to limit trans youth's ability to be themselves, to limit access to sexual and reproductive health education. And those are something that it's important to remember is closely tied to abortion rights. We see regressive social movements looking at anti-abortion rhetoric to rally people to their cause and to push back against democracy, against human rights. And now we're seeing this anti-trans rhetoric and action, which is obviously deeply harmful to trans and non-binary youth, but also part of this broader repressive backlash. 
And I think it's important, not only in that context, but because so much of what happens in the Canadian conversation and in the Canadian legal landscape and the media landscape is dominated by our neighbors to the south. And we have a different reality here. That's not to say that we are perfect, far from it, but the landscape in Canada presents different challenges and demands different solutions. And so that's why I really want to commend everyone involved in this report. I think it does a really great job outlining the different barriers to access and emphasizing that the focus is less on legal restrictions and more on the reports like on the sorry recommendations like improving sexual and reproductive health education, expanding access into rural and remote areas. And I think most critically, pushing back and ending systemic discrimination within the healthcare system more broadly, because we see the way that that limits access for racialized Indigenous, trans and non-binary people, as well as people with disabilities. And so until you actually tackle that underlying systemic discrimination, you can spend money, you can expand services, but there will still be so many barriers. Uh, and so I'll just wrap up by uh, just plugging some work that we're doing at LEAF, because um, I was told I can do that. Um, so we, we're continuing to advocate for access to abortion and other reproductive health services. Uh, next week with Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights, we're going to be launching an online resource called the Abortion Access Tracker, which is a comprehensive outline of policies, legislation, and regulations related to abortion at the national, provincial, and territorial levels. So would encourage you to check that out at leave.ca. Uh, and just to also say that our advocacy at LEAF also looks beyond abortion. And so Cheryl mentioned at the beginning that I lead our reproductive justice project. And that's really grounded in the work of Indigenous, Black, trans advocates um, who fought for these ideas for a long time, um, Black women in the United States who actually coined the term in the early 90s. And so we're looking at how do you advocate for economic stability through things like pay equity, collective bargaining rights, access to basic income and social supports. And we really think it's important to talk about abortion, but also to have that broader conversation about how people can live lives with the supports that they need. Uh, so thank you so much. I will pass it to you. <laughs> Maybe my way of saying I also want to <laughs> Um I, I don't have much to add to what's been said here. First of all, I'll just of course add my congratulations to the group that did this. I think it's an excellent report. And I was really glad to have the opportunity to offer some commentary on it and and um Please, that you took up some took up um, the things that I had suggested. I think uh, in the grand scheme, I have to reflect on the fact that I first started doing research on uh, access and equity issues for racial minority women over twenty years ago now, and uh, here we are twenty years later, and still so, so many of the same issues. And certainly, um, this report picked that up very effectively. I think one of the uh, changes that I see, and then maybe I hope to see, is that um, as we all reflect on the issues within the system that create barriers for, um, for people who are marginalized, uh, I think we are in a moment too where many groups are saying, uh, your system has failed us and we need to find other ways to deliver care. And I think that's very true for reproductive, uh, uh, reproductive justice issues, sexual health, all kinds of health issues and services. So I am very glad for the people in communities who are doing this work. I'm very glad for the uh, movements that are claiming sovereignty, not only over bodies, but over the people that take care of our bodies. And I think there are many opportunities for um, interdisciplinary collaboration on this. So my invitation to do this was, uh, was very much welcome. I'm grateful for the work of people like my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Bugun, who does work on reproductive justice. And I would love it if this is us doing more things together because there's so many things that law and social work have to work on and can work on together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, can I just see a show of hands about who was part of the working group? Who's in the room? Fantastic. So I was really quite blown away by this report. Um, I was absolutely, it is an, a very impressive piece of work. 
Um, and I was reading it thinking, wow, our law students wrote this. So just congratulations. It is just really a spectacular piece. So in my brief comments, although I fear they may not be as brief as my um, my panelists, um, uh, I wanted to focus on a particular theme that has always interested me um, as I think about abortion and, and many other issues as well, which is one of a theme of de-exceptionalization. Um, so, uh, and I see this running through the report, at least partially running through the um, the report. And as I say, this has long influenced my thinking on um, on abortion law and actually many issues that have been in the criminal law that need to get out of it. And so by de-exceptionalization, I simply mean the idea of not treating abortion exceptionally. So not treating it differently, but treating it like any other medical procedure. Um, and of course, the first step in de-exceptionalization is decriminalization, by which I mean here a very narrow um, definition of that, of just getting it out of the criminal code. Although I really take note and, and very much appreciated the broader conception of decriminalization, there was a, just a one paragraph in the report that talked about it as not simply having abortion per se out of the criminal code, but really making sure of removing any and all regulations and regulatory offenses that might uh, impact on abortion access. Um, but so criminalization, I think, is the most extreme form of exceptionalization that we can really imagine. And whenever, whenever I read about uh, the Morgan Teller decision, um, and here, indulge me for a moment uh, on, a, on a, a slightly more personal story, but of course, you know, abortion is a deeply personal, deeply, deeply personal issue. So whenever I read about the Morgan Teller decision, I'm immediately transported back um, to the mid-1980s and the political struggles to decriminalize abortion. At the time I was sitting where you're sitting now, um, I was a law student, a first and a second and a third year law student. And I cut my teeth, my feminist teeth, legal teeth, academic teeth, on abortion, on abortion politics, um, on the challenges that were going on. So the Morgan Teller Clinic was just down the street. That was before it was blown up. Um, I would go regularly as an escort uh, to help women get into the clinic. Um, I would meet them in local homes and escort them into the clinic. And we had to get past the protesters. Again, this is long before abortion clinic bubbles. And um, it, would, it could be violent. Um, the protesters could actually be quite violent. Um, it was always harassing and it was never pleasant. And then there were the operation rescues when uh, religious organizations would literally bus hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of often high school students um, to try to shut down the clinic. And those of us involved, where there were so many people involved at the time, um, we would go to defend the clinic. And at the time, so this is now, um, the Morgan Hall Clinic is operating. Uh, it's not really legal, but the challenges have started. So, uh, so the police are letting it operate, having laid the charges and the constitutional challenges are working their way up. But the police were absolutely useless in doing anything around the violence that occurred in and around the clinic all the time. So I do remember one moment very distinctively when we were there trying to you know, defend the clinic and you know, defend it from them trying to, to get in. And there was a, I don't know, a squirmish. A, that's a bit more than a squirmish. Um, and I ultimately got a boot in my face. Um, and I remember it very distinctively. It was a Doc Martin boot, about a size 12, um, by one of the Operation Rescue um, protesters. And the police were standing right beside me and did absolutely nothing as I was literally kicked in the face. And so I have held that moment with me. Um, for you know much of my life, I'm thinking about where's the next boot coming from? You know, where's the next boot? And there's always going to be another boot. So um, this, as I say, this was long before uh, uh, decriminalization. Um, uh, it was very heady days of, of pro-choice politics. You know, in contrast to uh, to what the anti-choicers were doing. You know, it would be there was regularly um, thousands and thousands of people would be in the streets protesting for pro-choice. Um, and all this was happening, again, while I was, you know, literally sitting here as a student. Um, I also wrote my very first academic article um, about the politics of abortion. And I wrote a little too Catherine McKinnon-esque for my taste now, but, um, but I, I argued one of the things was, I argued that constitutional rights would not be enough. Um, that of course things needed to be decriminalized, but constitutional rights just weren't gonna cut it. Um, it was extremely controversial amongst the pro-choice followers, but it turned out to be right um, because 
striking down, um, Morgan Tallis, striking down the, um, uh, the criminal provisions were, of course, not enough. Um, so the, the movement kind of uh, culminates in the Morgan Tallis decision, the subsequent failure of the government to pass uh, new criminal laws on abortion. The movement kind of subsides, but of course, as your report documents very well, and anyone who has followed this would know, the question of access um, and the exceptionalization of abortion never has. Instead, it's taken new forms in and through health laws and policies, and of course, um, as, as we just heard, the, the rise in a global backlash where abortion plays a very crucial role. So what I was particularly taken by in the report, um, I mean, all of it, but what I'm just going to comment on is um, the recommendation to not pursue additional legislation or a constitutional amendment to protect abortion rights on the ground that any such effort would actually hinder um, the protection and expansion of reproductive rights um, and be unnecessarily politicizing the issue as if it needs any help to be politicized, but that it would really, that it would make it worse. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, because I think I think any attempt to legislate constitutionalize, never mind that we can't do constitutional amendments in Canada, like we just can't. So like just get over it. Um, but legislating, you know, we do that sometimes. Um, it would reinforce, I think, the exceptionalization of abortion and all of its attendant political and cultural risks. Um, and this, I think, I, I I really commend you for taking this position because I think it's a hard position for lawyers to take. Um, it's a kind of occupational risk that we all have that is like, there ought to be a law. There's a problem, there's gotta be a law here. I mean, we just go straight to that. So I think I, I really, really commend um, the report and its recommendations for, for resisting that urge and imagining very differently, um, rather than just going straight to, you know, there ought to be a law, to think really differently about what it would mean to, uh, to support reproductive rights, focusing on access instead of legality. Um, and, I, and again, I totally agree with this. And then I also have, I would say, but, but it's more like an and, really, um, a question about one of the recommendations in particular. Um, and really, I agree with, you know, I, it's sort of like we all stand up here and go, we couldn't agree more, we couldn't agree more, we couldn't agree more. Um, but I'm going to, I'm just going to uh, uh, talk a little bit just about one recommendation, which is the idea that there should be a federal policy on reproductive justice. Um, and of course, while I agree with the spirit, of course there should be. Um, I think it raises some questions and some concerns for me. It's sort of like it raises the boot for me a little bit. Um, so it would be easy in principle, in principle, um, to develop a, a policy on reproductive justice. And in fact, you suggested a whole bunch of what they what it might look like. Um, but of course, the next government um, could just overturn it. So it has an inherent precarity. Um, and you know, the next government, which I shudder at the thought of it, but you know. A polio government. Well, um, uh, now he said he wouldn't ban abortion, but he's not said what he would do otherwise to undermine it. Um, and you could be sure that he wouldn't really be supportive um, of a federal policy on reproductive justice. And it would be very easy just slap the pen, get rid of it. Um, and then I also worry a little bit about the exceptionalism of it. Um, and the dilemma, as I see it, is that a federal policy on reproductive justice, despite being a great idea, um, would continue to exceptionalize abortion and everything that comes with it, including the stigma that comes with it. And here, you know, I go back to something that was discussed a lot in the 80s and 90s, and, and really I think it is still with us, which is this idea of the dilemma of difference, which is, you know, if you have something that is a, that is a difference, like something like abortion, which is a very specific procedure with it that is very gendered, um, uh, you can't not recognize it because it is something that needs to be recognized, but in recognizing it, you reinforce its difference. And in recognizing it, you then risk reinforcing all the stigma that goes with it. And so I'm interested in trying to think about how healthcare itself might be structured in a way that ensures access to reproductive care exactly the same way that it ensures access to all other medical care. Um, and of course, I see that as the goal of, and, and the spirit of this report, um, uh, but that we really need to think about how abortion can ultimately be completely de-exceptionalized. Um, and so the idea of a federal policy on reproductive justice, I think, risks actually reinforcing a little bit the exceptionalization rather than de-exceptionalizing it. And I say this recognizing that that there's no perfect strategy here, right? That it's just, I just think about, so what are the challenges? Um, so again, I raise this not as a criticism of the report, but as one of a myriad of challenges that need to be confronted as, uh, as we continue to engage in the ongoing struggle of ensuring access to reproductive 
um, care. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Now we have some time for questions. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes. Anyone, including Rebecca, who will turn off her camera <laughs> or turn on her camera rather, so we can see. Oh, there she is. Um, anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Um, just a question for Professor Cosman. Um, I think that your your comments just now were really interesting, and I'm wondering. Um, if you think a federal policy isn't like the way to go because of the except exceptionalization issue, do you think that uh, we should rely instead on kind of on the ground organizations like LEAF to lead that charge? Or do you see any issues with that as well? Um, I see no issues with LEAF leading the charge on anything. Go, <laughs> um, so, go to, my, where's the microphone? You go to. Uh, uh, so I, I think, I mean, I don't have, I don't have a blueprint. Um, uh, Give me a week. Um, uh, I don't have a blueprint, but I think that a lot of the other recommendations say around, uh, certainly around education, um, uh, around addressing systemic discrimination in the healthcare system, right? That is absolutely um, a completely crucial because just dealing with abortion on top of a system that is so fundamentally discriminatory against the most vulnerable isn't going to do anything, right? So, so, um, so I think all of the other things are really, really crucial. I also think that um, you know some of this is is working with the the medical associations um, and the teaching hospitals. Um, you know, like we, we're part of one. Um, so working with. I don't mean totally local grassroots, but I do mean more local organizations that are really the ones who are ultimately going to be the ones providing the care. Um, so, so I think I have a bit, you know, I, I would say that, but, um, but, but it's not a blueprint. I just want to offer Rebecca an opportunity to talk uh, to, yeah. to respond yeah. and also to respond to Brenda's comments about um, exceptionalization. Right. I, I think Brenda's comments about a federal policy are really interesting. And I guess I keep going back to the WHO 2022 guideline. And the it, you might call it exceptionalizing an issue, but that guideline, which is really the third in a series of guidelines that brought experts together to really think about abortion and the progress that that guideline, the, the, the series, the, 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 third, the third version is so significantly better than the first version. Um, the first version didn't even take a human rights approach. And here you've got the third version taking a human rights uh, uh, approach that mentions equality in almost every page. And you're dealing, it, the importance of the equality point is that you're dealing with health systems and medical systems that don't think in terms of equality. And you're seeing a shift in the thinking, but historically they have not thought in terms of equality. You go into the World Health Organization building, you go into ministries of health, they are thinking about how you improve access, how to ensure that they're evidence-based. So the shift towards equality that this Asper Center report uh, represents, I can't emphasize how significant that is. And that might be, as Professor Cosman said, a step towards de-exceptionalizing. But I think you're to ensure that abortion services are fully integrated into healthcare services, there is has to be somewhat of a transition uh, where we look at how to integrate them, and that might be continuing to exceptionalize them. Uh, but certainly the goal of de-exceptionalizing is, is laudable and I couldn't support it more. Now the federal government has recently, I think just last week announced that it will uh, uh, cover the cost of contraception or encourage provinces to cover the cost of contraception, which is a very significant move. Um, so maybe they are de facto aiming towards a federal policy. I, I, and that, that was just in the press and I, I was fascinated to pick it up. The other opportunity that presents itself 
is the move towards a generic uh, method of what's now called MIPI guide the medication abortion. The sooner we can get a generic version introduced into Canada, the better uh, for all kinds of reasons. It will improve access. Um, the cost will come down. Uh, the governments will, will maybe include it. Now, question why the government didn't also include a, a medication abortion in terms of supporting provinces to support the, the cost, I don't know. But it might have been something to do with the fact that the, abort the cost of Mythicaimiso is still um, inordinately high. Finally, I just want to mention um, the WHO guideline stresses the importance of access to information for all groups. And we really need to collaborate much more carefully with those in the healthcare system that are thinking about improving access to healthcare information on healthcare generally. I'm sure there's some wisdom in those groups on, on other areas of healthcare, but the importance of improving access to information particularly now that we have a self-managed option, although I'll buy it not in, in Canada, is very, very important. In part, because um, this week, and I'll share with the working group, um, there is significant, significant online sec uh, harassment of, uh, of abortion information. There's a whole group, uh, Women on Web, that's taking the lead. There's all kinds of meetings um, being generated on this. And I'm afraid this online harassment of abortion information and providers is going to come to Canada. So we've got to be uh, prepared for that. Um, and that, again, with a very practical to counteract that, we're going to have to focus on the specifics of this online harassment. So while I, I laud the idea of de-exceptionalizing, I think we have to be pragmatic because I think for maybe the foreseeable feature, we're gonna to have to focus on certain aspects of how abortion is being targeted. Thank you, Fred Cook. Is there, does it, are there any other questions or would our panelists like to comment on that as well? Any other questions? Yep. Just to follow up on the discussion on the exceptionalization. Um, I know that France became the first country that um, constitutionalized, constitutionally enshrined the right to abortion under the Constitution. And I know that Professor Cosman mentioned that um, amending the Constitution in Canada is like virtually impossible. I don't know that we're only talking about um, in the Canadian context, but I was just wondering your thoughts on this regional news and if you think other countries, including Canada, should follow suit. Uh, Rebecca, were you able to hear that question? Uh, no, it's something about constitutionalization, but I didn't get the, the full breadth of it. <laughs> I'll just repeat that in, in reference to France recently um, constitutionalizing a right to abortion and Canada's um, difficulties in amending constitutions, but what are the panelists' thoughts on that, um, um, that aspect of what France has done and whether or not that's even possible in Canada? So a fair summary? <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to... Uh, I'll, I'll just say, I, I, the what's happening in France, I think, is very intriguing, um, and certainly creating a site where this issue is discussed, where it's constitutionalized, is is you can't deny the significance, the symbolic significance of this. Um, so in in. in in interacting with some of the people involved in framing that constitutional amendment, um, I could be, I could, I could only be supportive because it's raising issues around women's equality that's so incredibly significant, um, especially in today's world. So I, I was excited for them. Now, in the Canadian context, it's very different. Um, I, I don't. I don't think there's the political leadership that would really drive this thing through. Um, I, but I'm not 
teaching Canadian constitutional law, but if Professor Cosman says it's just a no no go, it's a non-starter, then then it's not going to happen. But that's not to deny us the ability to ce celebrate other countries that make this happen, or just to the south of us to celebrate those states that have, in essence, constitutionalized abortion in the uh, state constitutions. Um, so where it happens, yeah, I'll celebrate it, um, but also recognize the very pragmatic approaches um, that we're trying to take in Canada. Um, they're not going to be as symbolic, but I think they're going to be uh, extremely important. Um, now, the key for me is, and as I keep saying to um, colleagues in France, well, how are you going to follow up on this? Um, uh, what's your next step to make sure that this constitutionalization really means something in the lives of all women in France? Um, and that's why I'm so excited about this particular Asper Center report is the way it opens up dialogue with people working on improving access, people in other disciplines, uh, because lawyers can take a very narrow approach to this. Open up to others on the panel who want to jump in. So, I, I mean, I can always just say that I agree with everything that Professor Cook says. Um, and you know. <laughs> I would also just say that um, uh, it, France is, is very unique. I mean, every country is very unique, but the abortion politics in France is very unique. Um, and uh, and it, it, abortion has a very different kind of significance in France than it does in the United States. Um, it, it made it, uh, it also, you know, their amending formula makes it easier. It's not easy by any means. Um, so I just think it's, it is, it's quite unique. Um, it is absolutely for sure to be celebrated. Um, there's no question about that. Whenever uh, somebody, you know, whenever another country like decriminalizes or adds some kind of abortion rights, of course, it is absolutely to be to be celebrated. Um, I guess I think that one of the things that people need to remember is, and, and Professor Crook has really already said this, is when, when a group wins a formal right, um, as incredibly symbolically important as that is, and it is incredibly symbolically important, and it comes after years and years of political struggle, once you earn the formal right, the work has just started, right? The work of actually being able to turn that into something that is accessible has only just started. And I think we've seen this over and over and over again um, in any kind of equality rights struggles that, that once a formal equality right is actually recognized, the real work of making that um, real in people's lives has just begun. And, and that again, is also why I really love so much of this report is just to say, hey, we're not gonna talk about legality. We're gonna talk about access. We're gonna talk about how, how to think about realizing access. Can I just say one more point about um, Professor Cosman's this idea of de-exceptionalizing, which I really like. The, the work in the report, starting on page 19, about international and comparative law um, is also extremely important. And the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination really started their committee that monitors its implementation, started an approach to de-exceptionalizing by its general recommendation on women's health, which essentially says that you have to um, decriminalizing de medical procedures that only women need is a form of discrimination. And that, that whole approach begins to situate abortion and other criminalized medical procedures in a broader context of equality. And that happened in 1999, and we're still working on it. Um, and that's another reason why I'm so excited about this report and the WHO guideline, because of its emphasis on de-exceptionalizing by putting abortion in the equality context. Now, I've recently done um, uh, together with Bernard Dickens, an analysis of constitutional decisions on um, abortion in different countries. And there's been some very dramatic, encouraging developments in Mexico, uh, Colombia, um, Korea, 
but not many of those decisions uh, maybe I don't have the exact numbers, but there there maybe were like almost two dozen decisions. Maybe a third of those decisions liberalize abortion using uh, women's equality. They're usually based upon privacy or security of the person. So there's still a lot of constitutional judges that don't get it, um, uh, that don't get why decriminalizing abortion is part of women's equality. And uh, I got so furious about this that I, together with Charles and Gwena um, from South Africa, we, we just decided we rewrite a decision in the spirit of all this work that's going around the world, which I'm so excited about, about rewriting uh, decisions that started here uh, in Canada with uh, Professor Ray Ohm's work on, uh, that was published in the Journal of Law, and, uh, the, not the Journal of Law and Equality, but uh, the uh, Canadian Journal on Women, Women in the Law, on rewriting uh, Canadian court decisions dealing with women on equality. And some of those rewritten judgments were absolutely inspirational. So uh, we have a long ways to go and uh, even on the legality issues, but for Canada and the context of its time, this report is, is so significant. I want to turn down to Dean Williams, who's grabbed the mic. If you want to jump in here, <laughs> I, I just I, I I'm reflecting that one of the places where I thought the most about um, what you can accomplish through law versus whether that actually solves your problems is around LGBT human rights in the Caribbean, and certainly decriminalization was part of the agenda there. But it was really clear that that was not going to actually get rights for people in that region. So I, I don't know if this is a bad dean thing to do, but I want to invite my colleagues, Stephanie B. Gunn, um, to, uh, I, I'm just wondering if you have any comments based on the work that you've been doing around. Oh, there's so many, and I'm just so excited to see this report. Um, should I do that? Um, I'll get it, I'll get it. Yes, thank you so much for having me as it's working. I'm Stephanie Began. I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Social Work, and all of my work focuses on um, expanding abortion access, particularly um, through youth-led research. So I've been working on a project through the, the CART Access Project, which is Health Canada funded over the last year, um, that's seeking to do a whole bunch of things, um, developing a virtual community of practice for providers who maybe want to get involved in abortion care provision, haven't perhaps done so in the past, but it's a remarkably easy procedure. It's not like brain surgery. It's very easy to administer medication abortion. And I think one thing in, in making uh, abortion less exceptional is just that there are there, if we made abortion on demand, um, you can get it anywhere. You can get it from midwives, from nurses, and that means NPs and RNs, um, pharmacists who know what they're doing, <laughs> pharmacists being able to, to dispense abortion care, and of course, uh, physicians. Um, but expanding the virtual community of practice, doing a lot more for continuing professional development. I'm working a lot on social workers' knowledge of um, how to refer. Uh, we often, because we're such a broad field, um, we don't train on all of the possible things that could come up in social work practice, but this is an area that we really can't be reactive on because the clock is ticking when we're talking about pregnancy. We don't have time to go out and research it. We need to have uh, resources and such at the ready to be able to refer people. Um, but I think something in making it less exceptional is um, just changing policies and regulatory bodies to make um, everyone who wants to be an abortion provider an abortion provider. Um, we see that in Quebec, midwives are already able to um, dispense medication abortion. And in pockets here in Ontario, uh, there, there are some midwives in um, CHCs that a doctor signs off on it, but then they actually oversee people through the process and it's working really well. Midwives know everything about pregnancy. Why wouldn't they know about this? You know, so I think that there are some, some great opportunities there, but just to encourage anyone who's interested to get in touch with me, uh, about the many resources that we're providing through, or that we're developing because we're about to launch many of these things, uh, patient decision aids, virtual community of practice, a lot of continuing professional development materials just to try to make um, 
make abortion as destigmatized and as at the ready for people as possible. And, and having more youth lead the charge. It's so exciting to see something like this come out of a university setting because we see such coordinated efforts around so many universities where they're anti-choice protesters. And I think we need to have a, a counter uh, to that by, by sharing reports like this, by having people who are partnering with student services to put up, you know, here's actually how you get an abortion. Here's how you, you do this, you know, demystifying the process. We need a lot more of that kind of information in campus spaces. So congratulations and, and thank you for letting me be in this space. And please do reach out if any of the things that I mentioned are of interest to you, because I'd be happy to share those resources. That's great. I have another question. Yeah, hi. I guess I'm just wondering, I haven't had the opportunity to read the report, so I don't know if there's anything in there that speaks to this, but uh, so much of what we've discussed today ultimately comes down to political will of, of especially provincial governments at this point in time. And I'm thinking right now a lot of New Brunswick and what's happening in that province, though there's obviously access issues across the country, but New Brunswick has been particularly um, problematic. So I guess I'm just wondering, given so much comes down to the political will of uh, provincial governments and whether they choose to fund clinics or, or different services or even expand um, the ability of midwives, as we've been discussing, and other practitioners to um, provide abortion services, are there any other solutions that um, either are spoken to in the report or that you've considered that may be able to get around the political problem of not making it dependent on who's in government at the time. I'm thinking, for example, you know, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with litigation in this space, but has there been any litigation to try to make the equality argument that underfunding abortion services is an equality issue um, and that provincial governments are failing to uphold equality um, for women and, and non-binary people or, or anything like that? Or any other solutions or thoughts on that? I know it's a bit of a big question. I want to I'll turn that one question over to Kat, because yeah. I know that Lee has been involved in some mm -hmm. of those endeavors. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that we and other organizations that we work with have struggled with because, I mean, at the end of the day, you can ask a government to do things. And if they say no, what do you do? In the New Brunswick context, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association has brought a constitutional challenge to that specific regulation that won't reimburse abortions that are had in clinic settings. Uh, I mean, they started that in 2021, 2022, uh, and the court system is very slow moving. It's something leaps involved in as well. So that's one way you can come at it. Sometimes you can try to come at it in terms of are there governments at different levels that are maybe supportive. So currently we have a federal government that is much more supportive of reproductive rights. And so advocating is that are there incentives that they can offer to provinces in terms of health transfer funds that are designated in specific areas. Um, that's, I think, an avenue that some advocates have pursued. And then and the question on the equality rights arguments on underfunding reproductive health care is a really interesting one. Um, and it's something we've we've been looking at in the context of not just reproductive health care, but also mental health care services, gender affirming care. Can you make that what's seen as more of a positive rights type argument? There's a lot of very bad case law in that area, um, but I don't think that that means it's not a good reason to try. And we're always trying to think about if Section 15 say it's evolving, Sharma was a bad decision, the Fraser was a better decision, and maybe we can get back to sort of a more, a more uh, a wider approach to equality rights. Maybe then it's something that we're looking at. But I, it is really, really challenging because I do agree with you. It's political will a lot at the end of the day. So now we said we would wrap up at 1.30, so I just want to give all of the panelists sort of a one last shot uh, if they want to add something. And maybe we can start with Dean Williams if you have anything more you want to add to the, the conversation. Let's do something together about this is what I want to say. As I, as you saw, I have an echoing colleague, lots of opportunities for collaboration and a very important area to work. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I would just add that, um, so having raised this question of you know, exceptionalism, de-exceptionalization, um, I am by no means a purist. Um, I am a total pragmatist. And, uh, and I think that 
one of the ways of thinking that strategy of moving forward is always to just kind of assess the costs and benefits. You're going to make a decision and you're going to do something, but you're going to try to understand what some of the costs and benefits might be. So, so for me, it's like I have this little, you know, this little thing, this little voice in my head that's talking to me about, well, remember, if you're going to do X, you might reinforce Y. And it's like, okay, but we're going to do it now anyways. So for me, it's sort of putting this on the table is just just remember to think about this while you're also developing your strategy. It should never lead to paralysis. It should never lead to not doing anything. It's just, let's just think about the costs and benefits of the strategies that we're pursuing. So let's move it over to Kat and then we'll give um, Professor Cook the last word. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't have too much to add. One of the things um, that I would just say though, in terms of de-exceptionalizing uh, abortion reproductive healthcare more broadly, is that one of the easiest things that everyone can do is just to talk about it. Um, I mean, I went to Catholic school, so we didn't have sex education, um, but like just the ability to have conversations with your peers, with your family, with people around you, with people you're mentoring, like take the stigma out of it. And that has a huge role to play in advancing rights in this area. It's over to you, Professor Cook. Yeah, you know, I'd just like to uh, follow up on Professor uh, Dean Williams's point about let's do something together and Professor Cosman's point about um, working with uh, different associations, medical, nursing, pharmacist associations, and uh, Professor Begum's point about, I stand corrected, I didn't realize that midwives in Quebec can now prescribe uh, medication abortion. And I'm wondering whether a very concrete project might be for next year and any students who want to put together a working group under the Asper Center um, auspices is to look at what it would take to give prescribing authority to nurse midwives, uh, nurse practitioners, midwives and pharmacists in other uh, provinces. Um, like they now, midwives now have in Quebec. That's a very, very significant step, especially in Quebec, which was the last to, um, uh, they for a long time required sonograms. Um, and finally they got rid of that. And I think it was 2022, it's cited in the report, but certainly a concrete uh, research project around this would be really, really helpful. Uh, and something that is concrete, very pragmatic and doable. Um, and with Professor Begum's work on access to uh, of adolescents to contraception and abortion, this could be really important. So congratulations, there's lots more to do and I look forward to following up with you when I'm back. So I want to thank all of our panelists. I also want to thank the students um, who worked so hard on this report. Um, all of you who are in the working group, but also um, our, our two <laughs> leaders, uh, Lauren and Ian. Uh, I do think that this is one of the Asper Center projects that really has, um, is, it epitomizes our goals um, and, and our function here at the, at, at the faculty in terms of a student, initiated um, work that became a, a collaboration with faculty um, where the Asper Center was able to sort of elevate that. Um, and that what I could actually see from the beginning in terms of what the proposal was to what the actual report was a real learning on the part of the students in terms of um, having, being able to consult and to be able to consult outside of the faculty and partner with people um, outside of the law faculty. I think that, that it's been a resounding success and I thank everybody who was involved, including our panelists today. <laughs>